I'm going to uh, try and do some fact checking of uh, various claims that I saw on the internet. <laughs> so I guess first things first, let's uh, open up a brand new tab. Share that screen, a new tab. Share that. There we go. Okay. And I think I'm going to go with this one where I'm down in the little in the corner here because I like that a little bit better. So my first, uh, okay. My first claim that I saw is a, a COVID related claim. Uh, copy. So is, is the post COVID vaccine, is the post COVID vaccine myocarditis 28 times more common than post COVID myocarditis? Cause that's, that's what I saw on, uh, I saw some right winger making that claim on on Twitter. I thought, well, maybe this is something I should check out. Um, okay. I'm gonna move this over my other screen where it's a bit bigger, so I can read it easier. And then I'm gonna move streamer and stuff over to this screen, so that's a bit, so that I can still tell what's happening over there. All right, we got. So let's blow this up. Oh, wrong one. Damn it. The screen gets boom, boom. So the first one that comes up is the cdc.gov uh, myocarditis and pericarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. That's from September 27th, 2022. See, I'm using DuckDuckGo so that I don't uh, have my own search biases uh, playing a role. Uh, I've, I've still got lots of cognitive biases that are going to push me one direction or the other in which way I'm, uh, I'm leaning on what I believe and what I don't, but yeah, essentially. So the CDC and its partners are actively monitoring reports of myocarditis and pericarditis after COVID-19 vaccination. Active monitoring includes reviewing data and medical records and evaluating the relationship to COVID-19 vaccination. Myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart muscle and pericarditis is an inflammation of the outer lining of the heart. In both cases, the body's immune system causes inflammation in response to an infection or some other trigger. Uh, both myocarditis and pericarditis have the following symptoms, as in chest pain, shortness of breath, and feelings of having fast breathing, fluttering, or pounding heart. And myocarditis and pericarditis have rarely been reported. When reported, the cases have especially been, been in adolescents and young males within several days after the mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. Interesting. So more often after the second dose, see, it still says it's rarely have been reported and when reported, it's been in these cases. Uh, so usually within a week of the vaccination, most patients with myocarditis or pericarditis who received care responded well to medicine and breast and felt better quickly. Well, that doesn't sound that bad. Uh, I mean, hopefully there's not that many people that don't respond well. Patients can usually return to their normal daily activities after their symptoms improve. Those who have been diagnosed with myocarditis should consult with their cardiologist about returning to uh, exercise or sports. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't actually give me like numbers. Uh, is there stats somewhere? Okay, let's go back to the search page. Uh, the link, okay, so this is actually a little ways ago. Myo, the link between myocarditis and, so we're looking at uh, yalemedicine.org, the link between myocarditis and COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Cases of heart inflammation reported post-COVID vaccination are usually mild and get better quickly, experts say. Originally published June 1st, 2021, and then updated in June June 24th, 2021. So this is still quite old uh, in the grand scheme of things. It's over a year and a half old. Uh, but myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart muscle. The side effect is considered important but uncommon, arising in about 12.6 cases per million second doses administered. 12.6 cases per million. I, I don't know how that translates percentage wise. I've got a calculator here. <laughs> 12.6 per million. So that in order to get a percentage, you go 12.6 divided by one, one, two, three, four, five, six equals. 
and then we'll multiply that by 100, and that gets us to 0.00126%. Um, yeah, so it's pretty rare. <laughs> Uh, I I don't want to downplay like the people that have ha- had this effect from the vaccine uh, or uh, after getting the f- vaccine, but but this this twelve point six cases per million it uh, caused the FDA to uh, place a warning on the mRNA vaccines, and it's important to note that the vaccination is still recommended for anyone everyone who is eligible. See, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices said that there's a likely association between the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and reported cases of heart inflammation. This inflammation may occur in the heart muscle, myocarditis, or in the outer lining of the heart, pericarditis. The safety group reports that the majority of cases have occurred in people 30 years and under, mostly in males, and more often than not, inflammation occurred after the second dose. Yeah, well, that that comports with what uh, the other... uh, I think that was the CDC I was reading, right? So perhaps this is that's just the both sources. This is citing that source that I already looked at. Uh, at this point, it's too early to tell what may be causing the recently reported myocarditis cases. As with many any medical inf- intervention, physicians and agencies, including both the F Food and Drug Administration. And the CDC continually monitor the use and side effects of vaccines, which is why they're looking into these cases. Okay, so the, and then this goes into a little bit more of what myocarditis is, what are the signs, okay. So we're looking at a, a very small percentage of uh, cases uh, related to the vaccine. Uh, let's go newsroom.heart.org. So what is uh, heart? What is heart.org? Uh, let's just... Scroll down to the bottom quick. About us, about the AHA. I'll open that in a new tab. And switch, share this tab instead. Click. Mm-hmm. The American Heart Association, that's heartdark.org. <laughs> um, the AHA has grown into the nation's oldest and largest voluntary organization dedicated to fight in, fighting heart disease and stroke. Text message. Mm-hmm. Oh, for fuck's sakes. I'm getting a lot of spam text messages lately. It's very crazy. <sighs> okay. So uh, we're going to go back to the other one because this is the American Heart Association. So there's no reason to doubt what they're saying. <laughs> so myocarditis risk significantly higher after COVID-19 infection versus after a COVID-19 vaccine. Amongst almost 43 million people in England who received at least one COVID-19 vaccine. This is August 22nd, 2022. So still five months ago. Uh, or f- yeah, five months ago. All, among almost 43 million people in England who received at least one COVID-19 vaccine dose, the risk of myocarditis was substantially higher in the four weeks after the COVID-19 infection than after a first dose of COVID-19 vaccine, according to a new study in circulation. Um, among nearly 43 million people in England, ages 13 and older, who received at least one dose and up to three doses of a COVID-19 vaccine, fewer than 3,000 people. So where was I? Among nearly 43 million people in England, ages 13 and older, who received at least one dose and up to three doses of a COVID-19 vaccine, fewer than 3,000 people at 0.007% were hospitalized or died with myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle, during the study period of December 1st, 2020. True through December 15th, 2021. So it's a year long study, massive, massive sample size, and still a very, very small number of people who were uh, affected. Only 617.001% of the nearly 3,000 cases of myocarditis occurred during days 1 to 28 after receiving a COVID 19 vaccination. Individuals with COVID-19 vaccine infection were at least 11 times more at risk for developing myocarditis in the 1 to 28 days after testing positive of if COVID-19 f- infection in- occurred before vaccination. The risk of developing myocarditis was substantially lower in the 1 to 28 days after COVID-19 vaccination than after COVID-19 infection, except for after a second dose of the Moderna v- vaccine. 
the risk of COVID-19 vaccine associated myocarditis was higher in men younger than 40 after a first dose of an mRNA vaccine or after a second dose of any of the three vaccines. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's a pretty, pretty, uh, like, uh, a substantial result uh, claiming that the <laughs> the the risk of myocarditis is incredibly high uh, from COVID-19 and not from the vaccine. Uh, so what was my initial uh, Google search? What was it that I heard on? Is the post-COVID vaccine, post-COVID vaccine myocarditis was 28 times more likely than post-COVID myocarditis. And it's essentially the opposite. <laughs> like, uh, maybe it isn't quite 28 times, but it is considerably more. Uh, see, we got another one. Uh, August 4th, 2021. This is uh, from New Scientist. Let's see if I can't get that a little bit bigger again. Myocarditis is more common after COVID-19 infection than vaccination. By Claire Wilson. This article was published in 2021. Read this. Uh, oh, a 2022 updated article. Myocarditis and COVID-19 vaccines. How rare is it and who is at risk? Seems like exactly what we're looking for, right? Uh, the claim is that it is more common, again, after a vaccine than it is after actually getting COVID, which is a nonsense claim to be like as charitable as possible. Like it is a nonsense claim to say that this, like that this vaccine is going to give you a side effect that the virus itself uh, would not have a higher risk of. At least to my common sense brain, it's a nonsense claim. Perhaps, like I mean, obviously scientists they have to look at this stuff. They have to they have to do the research. But it's a claim that in my in my layman's terms, I would reject out of hand. To be charitable, I'm uh, like to be as honest as possible. I'm looking at various things, trying to figure this out. This is from March 30th, 2022. With the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines being delivered to growing numbers of young people, researchers are again looking at the rare risk of heart inflammation. As the UK off, this see these are all in the UK too. Like, where's the US studies, or are the people in the US just so like they refuse to participate? So, no, oh, I'd have to subscribe. Forget it. Forget it. 450 cases of myocarditis per million in young males. Is that after the 77 cases per million in this was triggered by vaccination, a sixth that seen after infection, a sixth seen after, yeah. So 450 cases after getting COVID-19 per million. Still relatively low risk of myocarditis, uh, all said, but the claim is that it's 28 more 28 times more likely after a vaccination than it is after a uh, infection. So I think, I think we can, I think we can confidently put that, that to bed, right? Uh, well, what's this? This is another, this one didn't come up the last time, a uh, couple times. Clinical considerations, myocarditis and pericarditis after receipt of mRNA, COVID-19 vaccines among adolescent and adolescents and young adults. Uh, increased cases of myocarditis and pericarditis were reported in the United States after the mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. Data from multiple studies show a rare risk of myocarditis and or pericarditis following receipt of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. These rare cases of myocarditis or pericarditis have occurred most frequently in adolescent and young adult males ages 16 years and older within seven days of receiving the second dose of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. There has not been a similar reporting pro problem observed after receipt of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine from Johnson & Johnson. I'm sure, I'm sure that this is, this is all very boring for people, but I think it's important to go through and like, just double check like some like even outlandish claims like this that you see all right so let's let's go back home to the duck duck go home, my duck duck go homepage it's got my uh, streamyard and all my things that i do 
Uh, okay, so what's the next claim that we're working on? We're working on, oh yes, does alcohol cause cancer? Um, so what's a neutral weight? Is that a neutral weight? Does alcohol cause cancer? I wonder if there's like news. So the, why does drinking cause cancer? <laughs> Uh, oh, that's an interesting one from what is a C American council on science and health promoting science and debunking junk since 1978. Why does drinking cause cancer by Josh Bloom? This was written January 26, 2023. So four days ago, five days ago, there's no longer any doubt that drinking alcohol raises the risk of multiple cancers. Why alcohol? What is, what's it doing to us? And an episode of the dreaded chemistry lesson from hell. No extra charge. Pardon me. So, first let's tip our hats to the Environmental Working Group for successfully bullying Johnson & Johnson into reformulating its time-tested baby shampoo. What? Uh, okay, okay, yeah. I don't care about that. I care about the alcohol thing. Why does alcohol cause cancer? What? <laughs> it doesn't. Okay which probably requires some sort of explanation. And for that explanation, we know who to call, right? Stephen Irving are well-rested, cranky, and ready to go. Uh, okay. This is way too, like, this is way beyond my understanding. Um, so perhaps we should go to somewhere else. What about, let's go back to the all. Alcohol and cancer, CDC. The less alcohol you drink, the lower your risk for cancer. Drinking alcohol raises your risk of getting six kinds of cancer. Mouth and throat, voice box or larynx, esophagus, colon and rectum cancer, liver cancer, and breast cancer. All alcoholic drinks, including red and white wine, beer and liquor, are linked with cancer. The more you drink, the higher your cancer risk. So what are the guidelines for alcohol use? The 2020 to 2025 Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommends that adults of legal drinking age can choose not to drink or to drink in moderation two drinks or less in a day for men or one drink in, or less in a will, in, for women. If you don't start drinking, if you don't drink, don't start. That makes sense. Drinking less alcohol is better for health than drinking more. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so when you drink alcohol, what about the Canadian? Uh, Canadian report on uh, alcohol and cancer. Yeah, so here we go. So this is recent news. This is 14 days ago. Can India? Can India? I don't know this site. Let's do a quick, quick about. Look for the about. Mm -hmm. Recognizing the... Hey, I'm looking at this. Recognizing the need of the community, which you're in to have a newspaper that represented the viewpoint of South Asians in Canada. Okay, so this is for Indian Canadians. Uh, well, maybe maybe we better go to a different site. All right, well, let's just go with CBC, right? That seems relatively un, uh, uncontroversial. It's time to put cancer warning labels on alcohol, experts say. No amount of alcohol is safe, says a new report from Canada, Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. The pressure on government to put cancer warning labels on alcohol containers is growing, as experts say the majority of Canadians don't know the risks that come with consuming even moderate amounts. The latest catalyst is Canada's new guidance on alcohol and health. And open that in a new tab, we can take a look at that after which updates the 2011 Low-Risk Drinking Guidelines, the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction, which released its final report today, points out that no amount of alcohol is safe and that consuming any more than two drinks a week is risky. It's a drastic shift from previous guidance, which recommended no more than 15 drinks for men and 10 drinks for women per week. That's interesting. Why was there the discrepancy anyway? 15 and 10? To reduce long-term health risks, the CCSA says the new advice reflects thousands of studies in the last decade that link even small amounts of alcohol to several types of cancer. The new recommendations lay out a continuum of risk. Three to six drinks a week increases the risk of developing certain cancers, including colorectal and breast cancer, and more than seven drinks a week also increases your risk of heart disease and stroke, <clears throat> and the danger goes up with every additional drink. 
The last time we did the guidelines, it was in 2011, said Catherine per Paradis, Paradis, the Interim Associate Director of Research for the C CCSA, who co-chaired the scientific expert panel that came up with the new guidance. In 10 years, the, there's been... There's definitely been significant improvements in our understanding of mortality and morbidity associated with alcohol use. We have much better understanding of the link between alcohol and cancer. According to the report, many Canadians are already risking risky drink in risky drinking territory with 17% Canadians consuming three to six drinks a week, while 40% drink more than six drinks a week. Well, I got to say, uh, I'm, I'm glad that I slowed down on the drinking. <laughs> It wasn't that long ago that I was drinking like multiple beer every day just because it was something I would even like come home from the gym and I would have a few beer uh, while I was working on podcast things and what have you. And then I'll, every second Friday I was drinking beer while doing recording podcasts and whatever. So I'm quite, I'm quite glad that I don't drink as much as I used to. And it's uh, maybe it's time to cut it even more. All right. So that seems like that's pretty pretty well settled. Let me go back all the way to the original homepage. Where's my? I got two more claims. Um, no, I think that's it. Was uh, okay. Well, uh, let's do this. Let's do this because I've seen this. Was Putin provoked by NATO into invading the into in, into invading Ukraine? I've seen some people online saying that. <laughs> Interesting. The very first uh, link is uh, the U.S. and NATO help trigger the Ukraine war. Uh, this was, yeah, this is by Newsweek, three seven twenty two, by Ted Gallen Carpenter. Um, it's an opinion piece, but let's give it a shot. Vladimir Putin's decision to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine is a monstrous act of aggression that has plunged the world into a perilous situation. By any reasonable standard, his move was an over-the-top response to any Ukrainian or NATO provocations. However, that conclusion is different from saying that there are no provocations. As far as too many, yeah, as far as too many policymakers and pundits in the West are doing so now, yeah, I mean, it's obvious. It seems like it seems relatively uncontroversial to say that there's actions that NATO took that made Putin uneasy. Uh, feel like he needed to make a point, feel it like it was justified for him to uh, to uh, invade. It has become especially fashionable in such circles to insist that NATO's expansion to Russia's border was in, in no way re responsible for the Ukraine crisis. Uh -huh. Many dismiss all arguments to the contrary as echoing Putin's talking points, siding with Putin, or circulating Russian propaganda and disinformation, leaving aside the ugly miasma of McCarthyism Enveloping such allegations, the underlying argument is factually wrong. Russian leaders and several Western policy experts were warning that two decades ago that NATO expansion would turn out bad badly, ending in a new Cold War with Russia at best and a hot one at worst. Obviously, they were not echoing Putin or anyone else. George Kanan, the intellectual architect of America's containment policy during the Cold War, pre perceptively warned in a May 2, 1998 New York Times review what NATO's move eastward would set in motion. I think it's beginning. It's the beginning of a new Cold War, he stated. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely and it will affect their policies. I think it's a tragic mistake. Okay, that's interesting. That's the first, first article talking about that. He uh, clearly thinks that NATO's expansion helped create the issue. Uh, we got a January 29th, 2022 article from NPR.org. I'm not going to listen live. I'm going to sure accept all the cookies. <sighs> How NATO's expansion helped drive Putin to invade Ukraine by Becky Sullivan. This is on NPR. Russian military forces and Russian backed separatists have invaded new Ukraine. I mean, this is old news, right? The question is, did like my, my question is, did NATO's actions uh, provoke uh, the invasion. <clears throat> Should NATO, the mutual defense pact formed in the wake of World War II that has long served to represent Western interests and counter Russians' influence in Europe, expand eastward? Mm -hmm. NATO's founding articles declare that any European country that is able to meet the alliance's criteria for membership can join. This includes Ukraine. 
the U.S. and its allies in Europe have repeatedly said that they are committed to an open-door policy, but in the words of Russian President Vladimir Putin, NATO's eastward march represents decades of broken promises from the West to Moscow. You promised us in the 90s that NATO would not move an inch to the east. You cheated us shamelessly, Putin said at a news conference in December. That was December 2021. The U.S. Ban says a ban on expansion was never on the table, but Russia insists it was. And now Putin is demanding a permanent ban on Ukraine from joining the pact. I mean, ironically enough, uh, Putin's actions have almost solidified the fact that Ukraine is going to join NATO. So if it was what you, if you didn't want it, then you wouldn't, you would have done something differently. You would have behaved in a different way. But uh, maybe people just, maybe, maybe he thought, was, I don't know. I'm not going to make excuses for uh, Putin's invasion. I, I'm just looking for some sort of indication that it was, in fact, like, and I, it does seem like there's a couple of people that agree that uh, the, exp uh, the expansion of NATO. Uh, did provoke uh, uh, Putin in some way, at least. Uh, the Hungarian conservative, that's an interesting title. Uh, the war in Ukraine, what provoked Putin to invade most of the international... Oh my goodness, that's so small. This was written... This is back in January or February of 2022. I wonder if there's anything new. Putin's Ukraine invasion was pu has pushed Sweden and Finland to join NATO, but Turkey is blocking it. So that's interesting. That's not exactly what I'm looking for. Putin misjudged Ukraine. Is the West falling into a similar trap with Russia and China? Uh, that's 29 days ago. Vladimir Putin is now fighting a war against the West after, oh, well, that's the mirror. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I found, I mean, there seems to be a couple things that, like, new, that are older that were claiming that this was, uh, okay. Did NATO cause the war in Ukraine? From the hill, like this should be a pretty mainstream. Like this is kind of the uh, the uh, center of the road U.S. propaganda type in uh, stuff, right? Uh, did NATO cause the war in Ukraine? Harlan K. Ullman is another opinion, uh, and I I suppose at this point all we can say is that it is a matter of opinion for some that NATO's expansion caused. Uh, or provoked Putin to invade Ukraine. Uh, it seems like it's just a matter of opinion. And uh, yeah. In an interview last week with the Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera, Pope Francis said that NATO barking at Russia caused the Kremlin to react badly and unleash the conflict. Okay, when was this written though? 5-11-22. So that's... That's a little while ago, too. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be anything new written about this, but Putin became, right, yeah, so on and so forth. On New Year's Day, 2000, same George W. Bush would be elected America's 43rd president. Boris Yeltsin presidency left Russia in dire straits, psychologically damaged by the demise of its once superpower status. In his Millennium Address that day, Putin provided outlines of how he would restore Russia's greatness. Do, 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 do. Initially, they got along. Iran has uh, <clears throat> the new administration's obsession with Iran as the enemy led Bush to focus the Pentagon on missile defense and space. One consequence was that Bush announced America's intent to withdraw from the 1974 anti ballistic missile treaty that had been central to the US slash USSR strategic relationship. Abrogating the treaty did not go down well in Moscow, especially given the huge military technological lead the Kremlin believed Washington had after the 1991 Gulf War. Before, Did you have to add that was before 9-11? Did you have to? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 1991, 9-11. 9-11 was in 2001, for those who don't know. <laughs> it's very silly, I think, to add that because it should be well known. But when America intervened in Afghanistan in late 2001, Putin was irritated because the Bush team rejected Russian advice based on its decade-long failure in that country. In 2003, Putin strongly counseled Bush against invading Iraq, and uh, the Russian leader feared the region would be thrown into turmoil, and the continuing expansion of NATO was neurologic, neurologic for Russia. It was a series of U.S. administrations downplayed or how, ignored how serious the issue was for Russia. 
So we're looking even at, at 2001, Putin didn't like how much uh, expansion NATO ha- was doing. That's like 20 years ago. It was clear that Putin believed he was being disrespected and marginalized by the U.S. and NATO, adding to his growing resentment about the patronizing treatment he believed Russia was receiving. The 2008 NATO summit at Bucharest was perhaps the turning point. Georgia and Ukraine had applied for NATO MAP, Membership Action Plan, the roadmap to full membership blocked by France and Germany. MAP was denied, but in a throwaway line, President Bush stated that Georgia and Ukraine could at some date join. The promise was included in the final summit report so as not to offend the American president. Mm-hmm. Georgia and Ukraine had applied for membership action. Okay. But that, so that in 2008 they applied for, but they weren't uh, let in. So Putin was outraged and told Bush, this will not stand, echoing George H.W. Bush's response to Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait in 1990. Bush dismissed the warning. Ah, so he's mad in 2008. He's mad that uh, Bush stated that they could join later. Georgia and Ukraine could join later if they uh, were still interested. In 2008, Putin provoked Georgia to respond to a Russian false flag operation and subsequently occupied South Ossetia and Abkhazia with uh, contested borders. Georgia was technically ineligible for NATO membership. Six years later, Russia annexed Crimea from Ukraine, Ukraine, so that was 2014, following the Maiden Square protests and the unseating of pro-Russia President Viktor Yanukovych, accusing Washington of abetting regime change. This is something that you hear a lot from uh, leftists as well. Like I'm not, I don't know the details of this well enough to say one way or the other that the U.S. did or did not uh, enact this regime change, but. It wouldn't surprise me. They've done that shit before. Um, in 2016, Russia was charged with interfering in U.S. presidential elections. Yeah, blah, 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 widespread hacking operations. It's mostly been kind of like, it's kind of been discredited in some ways, but other times it's kind of like not as discredited as many on the left want to claim it is. Uh, it's, I mean, you can't blame Trump on Russia. That's just not a thing. But um, um, anyway. Some Democrats accuse Trump of being Putin's useful idiot. I know they do that. You know, liberals are going to liberal. And relations were made more toxic by a series of U.S. defense strategies beginning with the Obama administration targeting Russia as one of the five potential adversaries to be deterred and, if war came, defeated. Yeah, writing that down probably didn't help anybody. (laughs) Perhaps the incompetent U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in August 2021 convinced Putin he could take bold action in Ukraine without much risk. After massing troops on Ukraine's borders, Russia subsequently sent demands to the U.S., NATO, and EU calling for new European security framework, NATO retraction to the West, and denying Ukraine NATO membership. Each was rejected. Mm -hmm. So in 2021, Russia wanted... uh, NATO to reject, like to deny Ukraine NATO membership. And uh, that demand by Russia was rejected. Instead, the U.S. proposed talks on on strategic stability and arms control, ignoring Putin's key demands. When Putin decided to invade Ukraine, when when Putin decided to invade Ukraine is unclear, but from his perspective, he was left with no choice. Ukraine was a vital Russian interest to be resolved by war if necessary. The West failed to comprehend that. Could any U.S. actions have prevented the war? Probably not. But failure to consider unintended consequences is a lesson that should not be forgotten. So, I mean, again, not you don't make excuses for uh, the awful shit that Putin, like the invasion by Putin and the awful effect it's had on citizens of Ukraine. But it does sound like even even like sort of mainstream centrist uh uh, type of publications are still saying that, yeah, all in all, like it was NATO or American actions specifically that kind of led up to the invasion. Uh, I think it's, I don't know, at this point, it, it, I'm convinced uh, that <laughs> perhaps uh, there wasn't, maybe, maybe there wasn't much they could say or do to stop it, but also um, it sounds like multiple decades of uh, 
the way that the U.S. has mishandled their uh, relationship with with Russia ha- kind of led to this, the invasion. So, I guess I- I'm I'm just going off of like I read like what two or three articles there. That's kind of like that last one from the Hill. I would have expected it to be if it was going to give America a pass. That's the one I thought for sure would have given America a pass. So this last one, like I've seen multiple people uh, talking about this. Uh, Did the U.S. bomb Iran? And it's going to have to be like, uh, that's that's too old. I need something new in the past month, say. So Iran suffers drone strike days after U.S. and Israel. This is from Fox News. uh, From an MSN aggregator, apparently. Um, Iran suffers drone strike days after U.S. and Israel joint, launched joint military drill in the region. An explosion at an Iranian military facility Saturday evening, which authorities said was the result of drone strike, comes just days after the United States and Israel conducted joint military drills in the region. Iran's authorities announced Saturday that bomb-carrying drones targeted a workshop that operates for the Iranian Ministry of Defense in the central city of Isfahan causing some damage. The officials did not disclose what the factory produces and said the attack was unsuccessful. Okay. One of the drones was hit by air defense and the other two were caught in defense traps. Is this what I've been seeing people talk about? It doesn't feel like, doesn't feel like the right story. Um, but maybe it is like, I, I, yeah. Okay. Iran summons Ukraine, summons Ukraine's envoy over drone attack comments. Al Jazeera English. Oh, plus, plus, plus. The move comes after Zelensky advisor appeared to directly link Ukraine with an attack on a military facility in central Iran. Tahan Iran, the Iranian foreign ministry, has summoned the Ukrainian charge d'affaires in con- the country over comments made by a top presidential advisor who appeared to link a recent drone attack in central Iran to the war in Ukraine. The envoy was called on Monday to provide explanations over Twitter post by Michaelo Podoliak, a day earlier, according to Noor News, an, affiliated, an outlet affiliated with Iran's National Security Council. An explosive night in Iran, drone and missile production, oil refineries, Podoliak, an aide to President Volodymyr Zelensky, had written on Sunday, adding, Ukraine did warn you. Hmm. Other Ukrainian officials have yet to publicly expand on his comments, and the tweet is no longer available. The original content of the tweet is in the quote below. War war logic is inexorable and murderous. It bills the authors and accomplices strictly. Panic NRF, endless mobilization, missile defense in Moscow, trenches a thousand kilometers away, bomb shelters, preparation, explosive night in Iran, drone and missile production, oil refineries. UA did warn you. The tweet came shortly after a military factory in Isfahan came under attack. Three quadcopters armed with explosives. So this is the drone attack like that uh, that people are saying from the United States and Israel. Uh, but it doesn't appear that they know for sure. On the night of the drone attack, there were several other incidents in other regions of Iran, including a fire at a major industrial complex in the northwest of the country. Authorities have not officially linked the incidents. Uh, the minister, foreign minister on Sunday criticized the drone attack as cowardly, saying it was aimed at jeopardizing the security of the country. Iran has so far not officially blamed Israel for the attack, but it has previously been a target of many suspected Israeli strikes amid a shadow war with its arch foe. Israel has threatened large-scale strikes as efforts to restore Iran's 2015 nuclear deal with the world powers remain deadlocked. Meanwhile, Ukraine and Western countries have repeatedly accused Iran of supplying Russia with attack drones that have been used in the war in Ukraine, and they have imposed several rounds of sanctions on it. Iran has acknowledged supplying a limited number of drones to Russia, but said this was the start before the start of the war in February last year. It's interesting. It it does seem like very like potentially linked to the U.S. and and Israel, obviously, Uh, and like. It might even be a thing. Analysis, stakes rise as Iran can fuel several atom bombs. Okay, that's not really related, is it? 
<laughs> Iran has enough uranium to build several atom bombs, UN warns. <laughs> Five days ago. Uh -huh, okay. Stakes rise as Iran can fuel several atom bombs. TV reports claim joint U.S. Israel air drill will bomb Iranian nuke sites in Negev. So the claim that I'm currently looking for information on doesn't seem to be like right there. Iran suffers drone strike days after U.S. and Israel launched joint military. Yeah, okay. Israel signals to Iran that it's in sync with Washington. 2023, 131. That just came out today. Plus, plus. Israel signals to Iran that it's in sync with Washington and isn't afraid of a clash. While the U.S. did not carry out three recent strikes. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Sources in the U.S. made it clear. Uh, another time. Made it clear. Sources in the U.S. made it clear in leaks to the American media that the new government in Israel would not have bombed Iranian target targets without prior coordination. Hmm. Three recent airstrikes against Iranian targets in less than 48 hours have been attributed to Israel. In one case, a target inside Iran was, was hit, a weapons production facility in Isfahan. Subsequently, arms convoys from Iran were attacked twice. So it was Israel that did it, right? On the Syrian side of the Syria-Iraq border, most of the media attention focused on the attacks on Iranian soil, which, in which self-exploding drones were used. But it and the two massive airstrikes on the weapons convoy shows that Israel is stepping up its activity against Iran. So, without saying it, they kind of did say it, right? Uh, sources in the U.S. made clear in leaks to American media that the government, new government in Israel would not have bombed Iranian targets without prior coordination. And they have been attributed to Israel. So we know it's we know it's Israel. They know they wouldn't have done it without coordination with the U.S. So essentially the U.S. had a hand in in uh, bombing Iran. Uh, I'm not I'm not making any kind of moral judgment on this at this point. Like uh, foreign policy, like I, I don't like the U.S.'s foreign, foreign policy, but I'm also not one to be like, Hey, you're the enemy of the U.S., so you must be the good guys because that's not how the world works. Uh, the enemy of my enemy is not automatically my friend. Um, <laughs> I know that black and white thinkers like to think that way, but that's just not how it works. Um, so, yeah, I'm 51 minutes into just chatting, like talking about various these claims. So that's I've covered kind of four claims. Um, I went from uh, what was the first one? Here, I'll stop sharing this. Stop sharing. All right. So I took uh, four claims. The first one was post-COVID vaccine myocarditis is 28 times more common than post-COVID myocarditis. And I, I found quite a few articles and information that said that, in fact, that's just not the case. Uh, the uh, COVID infection myocarditis rate is much higher than the post-infection myocarditis rate. Um, so... That's kind of fact-checked, I guess. Um, alcohol causes cancer. Yes, it looks like that's just the, the case. Uh, it's been well-known for a while, and the evidence has been just accumulating and accumulating for the last 10 years or so since the Canadian standards came out in 2011. They've now uh, increased. So they, they don't recommend any alcohol consumption. And then was Putin provoked by NATO into invading Ukraine? And it certainly does look like, it, on some level, he was uh, provoked. Uh, not to say that he's still the good guy. I mean, he's still the aggressor in this case. Uh, he still invaded a country that wasn't the country he was actually having a problem with. Uh, but, <laughs> in fact, NATO's actions did, uh, or specifically America's actions, did lead up to, like, 20 years of aggression and 20 years of, like, provocation and, and various things like again Russia's not the good guy that's not how this works uh and also uh did the u.s bomb iran the u.s did not but it sounds like israel did um with u.s uh i guess coordination um so that's that's the end of uh the fact checking section of today um Again, I, I have no, I have no like, I guess, barring the damage done to individual human beings, 
and like say the murder of innocent people, uh, that I will always condemn no matter where it's coming from. But if you're just blowing up buildings or if you're uh, attacking like soldiers attacking soldiers, I don't have any like good guys versus bad guys kind of ideas on this stuff. I, I kind of dislike war. Uh, like it's not good to be attacking each other and blowing shit up and killing people. It's always just, it's always bad. No matter who's the aggressor, no matter who's, uh, the, the, uh, uh, no matter who provoked who or whatnot. Um, yeah, not good.